Okay, great. So uh, again, welcome everyone. This is the new session of the BioClock um, Academy. Happy to see um, you all here today. My name is Laura Pape and I'm a PhD student in the BioClock Consortium together with uh, Oana Jordiana Rus Oswald, who is a postdoc um, in the same consortium we will host the session today. And just a quick recap, um, the BioClock Consortium is a Dutch research organization which uh, was set up to study different aspects of the biological clock and research projects are divided into three different clusters with each specific specific focus from human health and disease to the natural environment and the protection of biodiversity. So lots of uh, different um, subjects. And so within this um, consortium, we um, thought to organize uh, this BioClock Academy lecture series um, to anyone who is interested in the field of chronobiology, especially early career researchers, but actually really anyone to introduce the basic concept, concepts um, and equip you with proper theoretical knowledge by expert speakers in the field. Um, and this uh, takes place every third Wednesday of the month, so today. So we will have a 40 minute talk and a 15 minute discussion. And um, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat and we will um, discuss them uh, afterwards, after the talk. Um, and we are aiming to close the session at around five. Um, so um, I'll give the stage to Georgie. Thank you, Laura. Also, hello from my side. Uh, I'm very happy to see many of you here. Uh, I'm also excited to hear more about the, today's topic. Um, it, is, it will be about the peripheral clocks of, in our body. And I'm very happy to uh, welcome on this virtual stage, Professor Andres Karspik, who will introduce us to the topic today. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, ich spreek in Betia, Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, but first, let me say a few words about our guest speakers. So Professor Andries Kaspik is a professor for experimental neuroendocrinology at the Department of Endocrinology and Metabolisms of the Amsterdam University Medical Center from the University of Amsterdam. He is also a team leader of the Hypothalamic Integration Mechanisms Group at the Netherlands Institute of Neuroscience. And his main research focus is on uh, an area located at the base of our brains, namely the hypothalamus. Uh, this primitive area is of crucial interest as it imposes our daily rhythms, such as the sleep-wake rhythm, uh, onto our bodies, uh, and hence it controls the rhythms of our lives. So um, um, his research aims mainly to understand how the hypothalamic system controls the metabolism, circulation, and the immune system. Therefore, he studies the hypothalamic biological clock and its effects on the hormone rhythms and energy homeostasis. Uh, I hope I was correct, but I think uh, Andres will give us more insights into that. So welcome, uh, very looking forward for your talk and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. you. Share your screen. Thank you, Laura and uh, Oana. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, in the in uh, uh, Oana mentioned peripheral clocks, and somewhere in the in the announcements there was also a peripheral clocks, but since this. These academy lectures are meant to be or, or introduce basic concepts. I wanted to start also at the basis. So I'm afraid there will be little peripheral clocks and I will focus today on the central clock. And then maybe at a later stage, I can tell something more at the, about the peripheral clocks. So when preparing today's lecture, I realized that um, my own career, scientific career, is only a little bit younger than the, than the discovery of the central brain clock, because the SCN, the superchiasmatic nucleus, was discovered in the early 70s, as you can see here, first by, by uh, tracing, let me change my uh, pointer, so first by some tracing and later by two lesion studies, um, and I started studying biology in 1978. Uh, I did it in Fraunion and my specialization was in behavioral neuroendocrinology. And these were the three subjects I 
have been working on circadian rhythm and insulin release, the noradrenaline projections to the dorsal medial nucleus of the hypothalamus, and, and hormonal differences during an agonistic encounter in rats. Um, and after my biology study, I moved to Amsterdam for a PhD on something completely different, dopamine and the development of the prefrontal cortex. But the good thing was that in the Neuroscience Institute, there were many people working on the vasopressin systems in the brain. And there are a number of different vasopressin systems. They are separated here. And so here are the, some of the people working on, on vasopressin at that time, Dick Swab, which you might know as the director at that time of the Netherlands Institute for Brain Research, and Fred and, and Eric. They were all working on the sexually dimorphic system. So the vasopressin system in some places in the brain differs between males and females. Um, but at some point, uh, they discovered that vasopressin was also expressed in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is a transversal section of the red brain. This is the third ventricle. This is the optic chiasm. And on top of the optic chiasm, you see the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this staining here is, uh, is for vasopressin. So everything that is brown here are neurons that express vasopressin. And Dick Swap was one of the people that found this vasopressin in the SCN. Um, so after my PhD, Ruud Buys asked me to, um, to start working on, on vasopressin in the SCNs. What could be the function of vasopressin expressed by the, uh, by the SCN neurons? And this was a kind of, um, and, and so I could combine now again my, my preference for uh, hormonal rhythms and endocrinology with uh, studying circadian rhythms. And but this was a kind of against a, a better judgment because a couple of years after the discovery of, of vasopressin in the SCN, people were looking at these rats, and these are the brittle bottle rat, and that is a rat that has a spontaneous mutation of the, of the vasopressin gene. So it's a, it's a vasopressin knockout. And when people looked at the daily rhythms in these animals, they found no clear differences as compared to the vasopressin intact animals. So the conclusion was then the vasopressin in the SCN is not really important for your daily rhythmicity. But despite that, we decided to start working on vasopressin. And that is mainly because of these publications where um, Gillette and Rappert and, and Schwarz show that in addition to the to, to the clear rhythm in, in firing rate you can find in the, in the SCN. With, with the highest activity of the SCN neurons the, during the daytime or subjective daytime, there's also a clear vasopressin rhythm uh, in the SCN or in the amount of, of vasopressin released by the SCN. So this is in the in vitro situation. And when the SCN neurons are most active, also most vasopressin is released. But you can also measure this rhythm in vasopressin in vivo when you take samples of the, of the CSF. So we had the idea that this, this rhythm in vasopressin release um, has to be involved somehow in the output of the, of the SCN, of our clock. Because other people show that if you make an SCN lesion, um, this rhythm will disappear. So the rhythm in vasopressin release is really coming from the SCN and not from these other uh, brain nuclei that produce vasopressin, as I, as I showed you a couple of slides ago. So this is again a transversal slide of, of the red brain. Now vasopressin is colored green. So here you can see the, the other neurons that produce vasopressin. This is the superoptic nucleus. This is the paraventricular nucleus. But here is the SCN again. So this is an in vitro slice in which we recorded the electrical activity of the SCN uh, of some SCN neurons. And after the recording, um, we injected a, a red dye in a recorded neuron. And, and so you see five neurons here and one of these neurons contained uh, vasopressin. So that is why it is yellow here. That's the combination of green and red. 
And we did it at two different times of the day. And then when you plot this data, you can see here again that if you combine all neurons, there's again a clear rhythm in, in the activity of the SCN neurons with the highest activity found when you sample during the daytime. But the most pronounced rhythm is find, found in the vasopressin positive neurons. There, the daily rhythm is, is very clear, clearer than in the VP negative neurons. So this was another piece of evidence that, uh, or, or at least an indication that there, there, there should be an importance for this output, vasopressin output of the SCN. And, and these experiments were done mainly by Michael Hermes at that time. Um, so if you know that there is a, a rhythm in vasopressin release coming from the SCN, then of course the question is, where is this information going? Where is this vasopressin information, which probably has some kind of time signal, where is it going? So for that, you can do so-called tracing experiment. This is again a, a, a section of a red brain slice. This is again the third ventricle. Here below is the optic chiasm. Now this tracer, this helis was injected in the SCN. So all the brown neurons here have taken up the tracer and, and all these white lines are uh, fibrous axons coming from, the, from these neurons. So you can see that the two SCNs, the left and right can, can talk to each other. So they can stay synchronized. But if you go a little bit more backward in the SCN, here's the third ventricle again, you see a very pronounced innovation. So amount of fibers coming from the SCN below this brain area, the PVN, also some fibers here in the middle, but not that much in the SCN, in the PVN itself. And if you go even a little bit further, then you come to the dorsal medial hypothalamus, which has a very clear innervation. So apparently this is an area that receives a lot of information from the, um, from the SCM. Um, this is a tracing experiment I did myself when I was a, a postdoc in the, in the lab of Paul Pivet in, in Strasbourg. So here again is the Fazilis coming from the SCN, again in the, in the dorsal medial hypothalamus. And then we stained adjacent sections for either vasopressin or VIP. And you can see there's a nice overlap in the traced fibers and the fibers that contain vasopressin or VIP, indicating that many of these fibers coming from the SCN contain either vasopressin or, or VIP. And this was done in the golden hamster, another species that is used a lot, of course, in, in circadian studies. Um, so then the question is, if, if now we know where the information from the SCN is going, to the PVN, for instance, and area between the arcuate and the, and the ventromedial hypothalamus, the dorsal medial hypothalamus, and, and we know that, well, one of the signals is vasopressin. Uh, the idea is that the timing information coming from the SCN to these areas will influence the, the behaviors controlled by these areas. So for instance, we know body temperature is regulated by in the preoptic area. We know that the arcuate nucleus is involved in feeding behavior. And then like the PVN is involved in, in hormonal rhythms like melatonin and, and corticosterone. So then we hypothesize, well, then we ask the question, can we prove that indeed such a projection containing, for instance, vasopressin is involved in the regulation of one of these rhythms? And, and so we focused on, on, uh, on, a, on a hormonal rhythm to start with. And, and the first hormone we looked at is, is corticosterone. For one reason, because it is a rhythm that is well known. It's also a rhythm that is, is quite pronounced. There's quite a clear difference between a day and night. Uh, and the other reason is that we clearly know the pathway that is controlling the release of, of corticosterone because that starts in the, in the PVN by the release of CRH to the pituitary and then from the pituitary ACTH is released and ACTH acts on the adrenal cortex to release corticosterone. And I just showed you in one of the, the tracing pictures that the PVN or at least an area close to the PVN receives input from the, from the SCN. And that is also indicated here. Now the brown 
cells here are cells containing CRH, so this neurotransmitter, and these black fibers are coming from the SCN. And although it's not massively uh, invading the, the, the CRH areas, there may be some contacts here, of course, and, and, and here, the dorsal area. So we wanted to test if, if these fibers indeed give circadian information to these CRH neurons, which in the end could then result in the, in the rhythm in, in corticosterone release. So what we did is we, um, um, we lesioned the SCN. So we removed the SCN here by making a lesion, which means you also remove the projections from the SCN to, for instance, the PVN. And then the same animals got a brain cannula through which we could infuse, for instance, vasopressin. So by infusing our vasopressin in the PVN, we were a kind of, of mimicking the signal from the SEN, but only at a specific time of day. And at the same time, we could take blood samples and see if the infusion here had an effect on, for instance, corticosterone release. So this is one of the first experiments uh, I did. So here is the amount of corticosterone circulating. This is the time, and here we infused for 15 minutes, either vasopressin, uh, VIP, or a control solution, Ringer. Uh, and you can see that vasopressin has a very pronounced effect by reducing the amount of corticosterone in the circulation. So vasopressin has an inhibitory effect on the release of corticosterone. So then again, if you think about the, the rhythm in corticosterone, which is in, in pink here, and this is the daily rhythm in, in vasopressin coming from the SCN. So it looks like that the release of vasopressin here in the, in the beginning of the light period is responsible for the low levels of corticosterone here by this inhibitory effect. Question now, of course, is how to explain the decrease in corticosterone at the end of the night because then vasopressin levels are still low. And, and so we think but in order to explain this rhythm in corticosterone release, you also need a, a stimulatory factor from the SCN. And together, this inhibitory signal from the SCN and the stimulatory signal from the SCN will form this peak in corticosterone. Because at this time, the inhibition goes down, the stimulation goes up. And then in the, at night, when most of the SCN neurons are silent, you don't have either inhibition or stimulation. So then corticosterone levels slowly will go down again. And then the next morning, the inhibition of vasopressin starts again to keep these levels low. And, and, and we think, and I will show you another example that this is a kind of a general principle of how the SCN controls rhythmicity by either at one hand stimulating um, the, 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 the mechanism or the parameter that you're looking at, the hormone, and at another time, inhibiting the release of that, uh, of that hormone. Um, so the results of this, this experiment were published somewhere in the early 90s. And the funny thing, as you can see here, at that time, we didn't pay that much attention to who should be the senior author, because Ruth Weiss was here just the second author, and one of our technicians was the, was the senior author. I don't think that happens nowadays a lot anymore. Um, so one of the main or the main question we got when we published these results or, or presented these results at the conference was, so what does it mean for humans? How does this mechanism explain the cortisol rhythm in humans? Because as you probably know, in humans, the cortisol rhythm has shifted 12 hours. So whereas rats and mice, which are nocturnal animals, have their peak uh, about this time at the end of the day before lights go off, we all had our peak this morning, I hope, because that helps you to, to wake up. And, and, and well, the most easy explanation, of course, would be that the clock would have shifted 12 hours, but at that time it was already known that the, the rhythm of SCN activity of the SCN neurons was similar in nocturnal and diurnal species. So how can you explain a 12-hour shift in, in a hormone rhythm when the clock is the same? And, and so here's an example, and this is one of the reasons why it's so nice to or work with um, uh, on the hypothalamus, because the hypothalamus is a very conserved and, 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 and ancient old brain area. So it's very much similar in, in rats and, 
and humans, but this is a staining for vasopressin and in a section of the red brain and the human brain can recognize the same structures. And, and they also contain all three of them, uh, vasopressin as a neurotransmitter. And, and by using material from the Netherlands brain bank, Michelle Hoffman was able to show that also in humans, indeed, vasopressin expression in the SCN shows a very clear day-night rhythm. So expressed here is the number of, uh, of cells in the SCN uh, that stain for vasopressin um, in, in brain material from, um, uh, from people that have donated their brain to the, to the Netherlands Brain Bank. But of course, in humans, we cannot do the experiments that I just showed you in rats. So we needed an, a, a diurnal uh, experimental animals. And, and at those days, in, in the 90s, they, they were not really available. So we had to wait a while before we could do the experiment we would like to do. Uh, and that was when um, uh, Paul Pivet again uh, uh, got these animals in his lab and, 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 and was able to breed these animals in the lab. And this is a uh, Arvicantus ansorgai, also known as the Sudanian grass rat, which is an animal a little bit smaller than, than a rat, but bigger than a mouse. Um, which has a clear diurnal activity pattern. And, and so what I did, uh, I went to Strasbourg and, and repeated the vasopressin uh, infusion experiments, but now in this diurnal animal. And what we found is that the effects of vasopressin were exactly opposite to, um, to the ones I found in the red. So how could we explain that? And, and in order to explain that, I first have to show you this picture again, that I, I was already, as you might have noted, a little bit hesitant about the amount of uh, input from the SCN to the CRH neurons. In fact, there was not that much input. Um, and another peculiar thing was that usually vasopressin is, has a stimulatory effect on the postsynaptic neuron, but we found an inhibitory effect on corticosterone. So in order to explain these this relative lack of input of the SCN to the CRH neurons and the stimulatory effect of, of vasopressin, we proposed this mechanism. And, and in fact, later we also provided uh, uh, in vitro experiment uh, evidence for this, that so the projections from the SCN are not directly on the CRH neurons, so the yellow neurons here, but they are indirect by the sub-PVN and the DMH. And you might remember, these are also the two areas that showed most of the uh, uh, fiber tracing in one of the earlier slides I showed. And so within the sub-PVN and the DMH, we think these vasopressin fibers will contact GABAergic neurons, so the green ones here, and these GABAergic neurons and project to the CRH neurons in the PVN. So this means that when vasopressin release is high, it will activate these GABAergic neurons and these GABAergic neurons then will inhibit CRH because GABA is a, is a strong inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter. And, and with this scheme, you can also explain the opposite effect of vasopressin uh, in the diurnal species because the picture is almost exactly the same in these diurnal animals. The only difference is here. And, 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 look, and then you have to look at the contacts that are made by the vasopressin fibers, because now they do not contact the green GABAergic neurons, but now they are contacting the pink glutamatergic neurons. So that means again, when vasopressin now is high in the morning, it will activate these glutamatergic neurons, but glutamate is a stimulatory neurotransmitter. So now glutamate will activate CRH. So now a high release of vasopressin in the morning means that you activate your HPA axis, so you stimulate the release of corticosterone. So just by switching the, the target neuron in, these, uh, in the sub-PVN or the DMH, you can make a, an inhibitory signal, like it is in the red, to a stimulatory signal, and, and get a 12-hour shift in your uh, hormone rhythm. Um, so that was the corticosterone story. Uh, and then, of course, the question was, well, is, is vasopressin also responsible for other 
uh, rhythms in hormone release. So we did some experiments looking at uh, uh, the, the thyroid system. So this is thyroid stimulating hormone. We found no clear effects of vasopressin on the, on the rhythm in TSH release. We had more luck with uh, luteinizing hormones. So that's the hormone in, in, involved in, in sexual behavior uh, and, and the Easter cycle. Um, so it's, it's the same kind of experiment again, an SEN lesion, infusion of, of vasopressin in, in one of the target areas of the SEN. In this case, the, the medial preoptic area, because that, that is where the GnRH neurons are located. And these neurons are responsible for the release of, of LH and FSH from the, from the pituitary. So it was already known when you uh, um, SEN lesion, a female rat, that a rat without an SEN will not be able to produce a surge in, in LH anymore. And what we showed is that if now in, in this SEN lesion animal, you infuse vasopressin in the preoptic area, then you will get a nice uh, LH surge again. So here, it seems that vasopressin has a stimulatory effect, uh, contrary to the, to the inhibitory effect we found in corticosterone. And these experiments were uh, done by one of my first PhDs in a, in a poem. Uh, and, and later, almost a year after, uh, other groups also found the same thing that vasopressin from the SCN has a stimulatory effect on, on the release of uh, GnRH and, and LH. And here is an example of a clock knockout animal, in which you can also reinstate this surge in LH by infusing uh, vasopressin. Um, but also for LH, we found that it is not a, a direct effect of vasopressin on the GnRH neurons. And, and only later, when gispeptin had been discovered, it became clear that the vasopressin and, and fibers in this case, synapse on these gispeptin neurons, gispeptin has a very strong and uh, stimulatory effect on the release of GnRH and, and LH. And here it is shown that these gispeptin neurons also contain the vasopressin receptor. In addition, again, a couple of years later, it was shown there's also an inhibitory uh, signal going to the GnRH neurons, and that is coming from RFRP, and these neurons are located in DMH. And here it is shown that both uh, uh, VIP fibers from the SCN can synapse on these neurons, as well as uh, vasopressin fibers. So again, if you look now at the release of LH, it's seen there is a, a, both a stimulatory signal from the SCN and an inhibitory signal being in this case, well, this, this is the, the neurons they're acting on, on the Kispeptin uh, uh, and the RFP, and they produce then the stimulatory and inhibitory signal on the, on the GnRH neurons. The activity of the Kispeptin and RFP neurons is regulated by the SCN, and that is how you can get a daily search in, in LH. Um, another well-known uh, um, mechanism or, or, or uh, uh, piece of physiology that is controlled by vasopressin and it's been known for a long time is, is body temperature. Also, body temperature is affected by, by vasopressin in the brain. And, of course, we know uh, body temperature has a very clear day-night rhythm. So a couple of years ago, Rubeus, now being in uh, Mexico, was able to show that vasopressin, also via the preoptic area, is able to uh, uh, create this daily rhythm in, uh, uh, in body temperature. Because here is an infusion of, of vasopressin at the end of the, of the dark period. And then vasopressin has an inhibitory effect on, uh, on body temperature. But on the other hand, when at the beginning of the light period, you infuse an antagonist of vasopressin, then it blocks the normal decrease in, in, in body temperature. Because during the light period, when the animals sleep, your body temperature, the body temperature of the rats is lower. 
And, and Ruth and his team in Mexico were able to show that, again, there's two factors involved. In this case, vasopressin from the SCM and alpha MSH from the acute nucleus. And together, they control the, the daily rhythm in, uh, in body temperature. That's the one in, in red here. So now the rise in vasopressin release in the morning, uh, next to inhibiting corticosterone, it also inhibits body temperature. And so one more nice example of, of how vasopressin can control rhythmicity. This is by the group of, uh, of uh, Charles Boerke in, uh, in Canada, where he showed that uh, vasopressin from the SCN is acting on these neurons in the OVLT that are uh, responsive to osmotic stimuli. And, and vasopressin is, is uh, modulating the how strong these neurons respond to an osmotic stimulus. And by modulating that response, uh, it also modulates the effect on these magnocellular neurons that also produce vasopressin. Because vasopressin as a neurohormone is known to act on the kidney as an antidiuretic hormone. And, and by modulating the, the input to these magnocellular vasopressin neurons, vasopressin from the SCN, can, can uh, uh, modulate the daily rhythm in, uh, in drinking behavior. That's what, what they concluded, the team of, of Charles, that this vasopressin neurotransmitting mediates this anticipatory thirst prior to sleep. So it prevents dehydration during sleep. And one of the things we found is, is what can happen when you're daily rhythms are disturbed is when we uh, put some animals in, uh, in dim light conditions, it's indicated here. Uh, what we found in that condition is, is that the rhythms are disturbed and you get a kind of a, of a secondary rhythm, not only a 24 hour rhythm, but also a rhythm with a period of, of 25 and a half hours. Um, in this condition, the, the rhythm in vasopressin is also almost gone in the SCN. And now when you look at the drinking behavior of the animals, first in black here, you can see that this is the anticipatory drinking behavior at the end of the night, so before the animals go to sleep. But in the dim light condition where your SCN rhythm is disturbed, also this drinking peak has, has disappeared. So this is one way in how a disturbed clock can, can also disturb your physiology. And, and these experiments were done by Valentina in our group. Um, so these were some examples of how and, and some proof that the rhythm in vasopressin coming from the SCM can modulate different rhythms or, or can create a daily rhythm in different behaviors by, by its input to different uh, brain areas. Um, one of the hormones we also looked at is, uh, is melatonin. But to our disappointment, and, and so first we showed that um, there is a there is an, a connection between the pineal and the SCN by injecting a retrograde tracer in the pineal. The the this transsynaptic tracer will travel all the way back to the SCN. That is shown here. So here in Red are the vasopressin neurons, and green are the neurons labeled by the tracer in the pineal. So also vasopressin neurons might project to the pineal, but there was also co-localization in the, in the VIP neurons. Uh, and then when we looked if vasopressin could also modulate the uh, melatonin rhythm, we were kind of disappointed because it had no effect at all. So here we infused vasopressin at the end of the night, so when normally vasopressin is low, uh, and you would expect that, or at least we expect that the vasopressin would inhibit the release of melatonin here, because the idea was uh, vasopressin is high during the daytime when melatonin levels are low. But as you can see here with the blue line, there was no effect of, of vasopressin whatsoever on the rhythm in, uh, in melatonin. So we did additional experiments and uh, then we found out that in this case, the 
stimulatory signal from the SCM is glutamate, and the inhibitory signal is GABA. And together, glutamate and GABA create this rhythm in, in melatonin release. Um, and then at a certain point, I went back to my um, to um, some research I did when I was still a student in Groningen, when I was looking at this, this rhythm in, in uh, insulin release. These are peaks of insulin when the animals are, are feeding at different times of the day. Um, and, and when taking up these experiments again, we found this was my second PhD, Suzanne Lafleur, who found this ni nice rhythm in, in, uh, in glucose. Um, so when we did some more research and, and tried to figure out how is this rhythm in, in glucose concentration determined, um, we did a similar kind of experiments again, infusions in the PVN, the PVN with the idea that maybe via the PVN and, and its projections now to the spinal cord, so via the autonomic nervous system, which is similar to, to what we showed for, the, for how it controls the melatonin rhythm, maybe via this pathway, it also could control uh, glucose production by the liver. And, and what we found is that again, indeed glutamate and GABA were responsible for sympathetic input to the liver and, and for modulating this sympathetic input and thereby modulating glucose production by the liver. So what is happening is that there's a kind of continuous stimulation of these autonomic neurons by glutamate. Uh, and at the same time, there's a daily rhythm and GABA release to that same neuron. And so you can look at it as, as GABA seems to work as a kind of a, a traffic light. If these neurons are activated um, only when there is no uh, when there's no GABA release. Uh, but then when GABA release goes up again, the activity of this neuron will be stopped and it will not stimulate the liver to produce glucose. So since liver and, and pineal seem to be regulated in the same way by this combination of glutamate and GABA, but we also know that the, the phasing of these rhythms, so the time when they peak is different, pineal or the melatonin is high at night and glucose is high at the beginning of the, or end of the light period, beginning of the night. So this means that there have to be different subpopulation of GABAergic neurons in the SCN with, with a different timing of their rhythmicity that are controlling these pre-autonomic neurons. And there should also be different neurons controlling either the pineal or the liver. So this, this indicates that within the SCN, or the SCN is not one nucleus producing one output, but there are subpopulations of SCN neurons producing different rhythms and, and uh, as, as an output. Um, so kind of different traffic jams for the GABA rhythms. Okay, so this was all about output. Um, and, and this is again the picture I showed you in the beginning. So the, the rhythm of, of vasopressin release in the CSF. Um, when we started our research, we also did a study where we looked at the amount of vasopressin within the SCN itself by using microdialysis. And we found that also within the SCN itself, you can find a nice rhythm in the amount of vasopressin released. Other people show that indeed, SC, uh, a vasopressin within the SCN also has an effect on, on superchiasmatic neurons. And again, other people show that uh, clear vasopressin receptors, both the V1A and the V1B are expressed in the SCN. And so vasopressin apparently... Yeah. Sorry for interrupting, just wanted to let you know that we would have five more minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm almost done. Yeah, perfect. Um, so phrase pressing is not only an output, but apparently it's also an input to the SCN, or at least has also a function within the SCN. And that became more clear when people looked at this um, vasopressin knockout mouse, the, the activity, the daily activity of the vasopressin knockout mouse. But this is what happens in wild-type mice when you put them from LD to, to DD, this 
different kinds of free running rhythms. And this is what happens in these knockout mice. Okay. You can see, well, they are clearly different from these kind of rhythms in, in the wild type mice. And, and became even more clear when uh, this group did a, a phase shifting experiment with these knockout mice. So this is what happens when you phase shift the light dark cycle of a wild type mice. It takes a couple of days before the animal isn't trained again. So this is what is happening in knockout mice. It is almost immediately jumps to the new uh, uh, onset of, of the dark period. And so it's illustrated graphically here. So a couple of days for, for wild type mice to adapt to the new light dark cycle, whereas the uh, knockout mice almost adapt uh, instantaneously. Um, so it was indicated that by blocking vasopressin receptor, you can reduce your, your jet lag. But then of course the question is why would evolution want to reduce jet lag? And, and I think we think that there may be an answer in some of the, of the feeding experiments we did. Again, when I was a student, I, I developed this uh, feeding schedule with giving animals uh, one meal every four hours. And in total, the, the, this meal counts up to what animals normally eat uh, at Libertum. Later on, the group in Strasbourg with uh, Parve Mendoza and, and Etienne Chalet also used this uh, schedule, but they also reduced these, the feeding time and in that way could induce a hypercaloric intake uh, in, in these animals. And when you do that in mice, it turns out that some mice can more easily adapt to the schedule than other mice. So what is indicated here is how much uh, uh, body mass these animals lose. So the black ones have less than 10% body loss, but the animals that can adapt, not that good, they have a loss of more than 10%. And so they call that the isocaloric and the hypercaloric group. And there was a clear difference in the activity pattern of these two groups. Whereas the isocaloric animals, they st stay nicely rhythmic. Uh, the hypercaloric mice, they show a phase advance or at least a clear phase shift of the rhythm and they become more diurnal. They have more activity during the light phase. And, and what is also happening in these hypercaloric mice that they have difficulties in maintaining their normal body temperature. They have a lower body temperature. So when I saw these pictures, uh, that made me think of the experiments that Rolf Hutt was doing in Groningen uh, with animals that had to work for food uh, because these animals also shifted their activity to the daytime. And according to Rolf, this is because that is a way to save energy. Um, but when we then looked at the SCN of these animals, um, of these animals on, on the six meals feeding schedule, uh, this is one of the clock genes per two. It's normally rhythmic in all the groups. But when we look at vasopressin expression in the SCN, in the, in the animals on the fixed meals feeding schedule, this rhythm is, is disturbed. And, and so these are experiments done by, by Satish and uh, Etienne in Strasbourg. So what I think is happening here is that if there is less vasopressin released within the SCN, uh, it's not to cure your jet lag, but it's to make your clock more flexible. And in conditions where uh, there's not that much food found at night, the animal has to be able to start looking for food during the daytime. But of course, then the, his clock needs to be more flexible to allow him to be active during the daytime. And, and the funny thing is that when you look back at some earlier results in the Brattleboro rat, so this is the rat with the spontaneous vasopressin knockout, it had already been shown that this battle ball red could more easily adapt to such a, a, a restricted feeding pattern, daytime restricted feeding pattern. So they are much more active during that daytime meal than the normal wild type reds, probably because they don't have vasopressin within their SEN. Um, so with that, vasopressin you know, in the SEN are critical for signaling outside the biological clock. But in addition, the outside also signals back to vasopressin neurons within the SCN, and in that way may change uh, signaling within the, in the clock and make the clock more 
uh, flexible. So these are my final conclusions that the SCN controls peripheral hormone blooms by its projection to both neuroendocrine and preautonomic neurons. Uh, the projections to the preautonomic neurons seem to be direct, as those to the neuroendocrine neurons seem to be indirect. Uh, and yet the SCN contains several subpopulations of neurons with differently phased rhythms. And of course, also other people have, have shown this in, in other ways. And as to vasopressin, vasopressin is a valid output of the clock. And I showed you some examples of that. Uh, but vasopressin released within the SCN might enhance internal synchrony, which means that without vasopressin release in the SCN, it may allow the animal uh, to be active outside of its normal, let's say, comfort zone. Um, and, and as I said in the beginning, this was all about the central clock. Uh, but maybe in the next time I can tell you how we think that the central clock can control these peripheral clocks. And with that, I like to thank all my PhDs, current and, and former, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andres, for this really, really interesting talk.